Put out the call to one and all, so let's do this thing all right. Everybody came, hell was raised, yeah, we tied one on last night. Just because the sun is coming up, don't mean it's got a hand. Just a good time starting over again. The inspiration for this record has been an interesting process because I, because I had so much time to write this next record, I wanted to make sure, like building a house, you know, that the foundations were good. So that meant the first three or four songs you write that you think will helpfully, hopefully theme the record a bit, uh, are going to be the ones that are going to be the foundation. So the rest of the house is strong, you know. I want the album to be like a house. It, nothing to do with the fact that it's called Home. So every, every song on this record, on Home, had to really deserve its place. It's like picking a state of origin team, you know, for Queensland or New South Wales. You've got to make sure that everyone that, that fulfills those Guernseys deserves to run on that field. And um, I'm really looking forward to being able to see which ones are going to step up to the mark and play even better than I thought they would. And there's always those dark horses like that, and I think they're, um, they're waiting to be recorded tomorrow when we go into the studio, and it's just very exciting. I think, um, to me, theming a record is, is one thing, but you've got to have songs that I think are relatable and that people can really get their teeth into and go, wow, I can see a part of me in those tunes. And that's what I'm hoping they see in this particular record as well. And I feel really, really positive about it. And I feel really odd driving on the wrong side of the road, by the way. I've only just picked up this car the other day and I'm on the wrong side of the road compared to Australia. And I've just realized I've taken a wrong turn, so you're gonna have to come for a run with me. <laughs> yeah, we're still rocking, so I roll over now. We're still walking, we're still talking, the best that we know how. You were fading out till you heard the sound of margaritas on the blend. That's the good time story. Well, here we are, Starstruck Studios. Everyone's arrived and they're doing a bit of a sound check. Get it together, first day of recording. I've been sitting around at the motel, like just biting at the bit to get in here and start this record. And um, to just see everything getting set up out there has been awesome. Got the microphones ready and everything up in the room. It's just fantastic. So now we're going to go and press red. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So it should be great. Well, I was sitting down with my little boy and we're talking about guitars and trading a couple of chords and it was quite interesting. And like he said to me, he said, do you, do you reckon I could just join a big band, like U2 or something? And I said, <laughs> it's not just about joining U2. I said, first of all, Bono would have to leave and then you'd probably, you know, get to go through a process of getting in the band. He thought it was as easy as just joining U2. And I started vamping along on the electric guitar and he said, we've got to mention some great guitar players in this song and what they would say to someone looking in a, sh a shop window, just gawking at the guitars, you know? And um, all they'd say is just play the things, you know? And just, that, my biggest, I, I suppose, reason for putting this song on the record is to encourage kids to pick up guitars. And I've spoken to um, a lot of friends about how there's a big lacking in that, but I reckon it's got, there's gotta be a resurgence in guitar. And this, this hopefully will be the song that just turns them on and says, yeah, why not? <laughs> The bunch of players we've got here has been hand-picked, I, I guess, because of, of records that I've heard here in Nashville. And we'll start with a bass player, like Michael Rhodes. I don't think there's many records he hasn't played on, but when I listened to the stuff that he played with George Jones and Alan Jackson, I thought, well, between him and Eddie Bay as the drummer, there's this rhythm section thing that is just locked up and really, really tight, and I think they work so well together. Like you can just tell it's been years and years and years of playing, they get to know each other's playing so well. So you know, when it comes down to the, the kick drum, you know, lining up with the bass player, it's just happening. Before they even sort of start playing, they're communicating about what they're going to do, and that to me is the most important part. Yeah, I'm wrong about that. Keep it, um, don't bring it down for the bridge. <laughs> One of my favourite films is Forrest Gump and love every minute of it and he had this saying in there with stupid is stupid does and I used to love the way he'd say it and I sat down one day thinking about 
trying to change the context of what he'd said into something about what country does for me. And country's been, I mean, obviously from an Indigenous perspective, we say country as being it's where you're from. But um, being a country artist too, I, I really tap into my rural roots from Grafton and the stuff we'd look at and do and the, the way that everyone was welcoming and, and everyone would have an open door if you had trouble or whatever, you know, it was, it was always a welcoming place. So I said to Cole Buchanan, he came to the farm for a couple of days and he says, listen, what have you got on the go? What, what are your ideas? And I said, well, this first thing is, is it's country, what country is to me. And it's not just the, the people, it's the music, it's the, it's the atmosphere that you, that you go and, and become a part of. And he said, no, well, let's sit down and work out what we're doing. And I told him about my cousin that came out from Sydney once, which we call the Big Smoke. And she, wouldn't, she was so prissy, she wouldn't even swing on this, this swing at this rope we had down at the river. It took us about an hour to get her to at least have a go. So she got in her swimmers and out she went. And after the first swing, it was like, that was it. She was in love with the bush. She wanted to move back to Grafton. She didn't even know where eggs and milk came from. It was very, very bizarre. They said she thought it all came from a packet in a shop. And she came back and then every trip after that, I think she just realised the fun she was in for when she came back to a small town. What I try to achieve in this song with Cole Buchanan was, you just don't get that in cities. You just do not get that in cities. And it's just a very, very special part of my heart. And that's why I love to go to small towns. We spend most of our time on the road playing country music. And that's the big draw card. With Steve Nathan too, I mean, look, he's been a real surprise and a bit of a dark horse because I hadn't heard of Steve. Um, we were trying to get John Hobbs and, and John had a hip replacement, so there was just another bunch of players to, to draw on. And Steve adding what he adds too has been phenomenal. And you can see by the range of gear, but he's got the vintage stuff right through to the brand new stuff as well, which is amazing. And I've really loved watching him get on the grand piano in there, do his thing, play the, the traditional style stuff, and yet he'll come back out here and he's on this beautiful Hammond and just you can hear the just the quality in his gear so I think it, it goes without saying I mean these these guys know what they're up to but you ask for a sound and they've got it you know so that was that was a main part of, of getting Steve in for this session as well the fact that he had this big variety of beautiful sounds to choose from and he was just asking us our opinion and we we're just giving him a little bit of direction but leaving it up to him too these players know what they what they can give you and they can hear what a song requires Little garden path where we cried and laughed. An old swinging gate that never used to latch. Two loving arms when your knee was scratched. Home. Well, you know, getting back home to Grafton for me is is a really important part of my my year when I can and. Um, the last time I did go home with the kids, that they were on holidays, and Laurel, as usual, just suggests out of the blue, look, I'm, I can't get holidays. Um, can you do something with the kids for a couple of days? And why don't you take them to Grafton? I said, yep, that'd be awesome. So I decided I'd go home to Grafton and spend a night with mum and spend the night with my auntie Jenna and watch the state of origin with my cousins, go to a, a big indigenous day we had at home for NAIDOC week and see a lot of my relations and family I haven't seen for a while in one big hit. And the kids loved every minute of it. But it was really important, I suppose, before I left to go on that trip, was to sit back and reflect about what I was about to go back and see. And the fondest memories I had back home uh, were growing up at my nan's place at a very, very early age. And the first thing I took the kids to see when I got to town in, in, in South Grafton was my name written in the cement at my nan's place. And it had just Troy written in capitals and 1974. And I remember the day the bloke came with a little cement truck that he had and as they poured it, my pop was just trailing it out. And he was making, obviously in those days, people did all this stuff by themselves. And my pop was a very, very handy bloke. And everyone called him dad. So we always would say, who's working with dad today? We used to love it on a weekend. We'd go down and build a shed or we'd, we'd fix a fence or something like that. 
And the day the cement truck arrived and all my first cousins were there helping pop with this thing. We'd formed up all the boards and we were about to pour all the cement. And just before the cement was going off, everyone had a stick with, with Dad. And we'd all walk over and scratch our names in. And um, it was the first thing that really tipped me off. I got my camera and took a photo of it. And that became this song, basically. So um, it's called Home. I'm going to call the album Home because I think it's, it's something that's very special to a lot of people. We all have our own interpretation of home. And this was just my basic idea of what home meant to me and what it means now as well. Standing proud and tall, and even though it's small, our world is in this street with them I have it all. And now when I'm away, I yearn every day for home. So, you know, me doing this thing self-produced, I guess you leave it up to the players a little bit more than most producers would. Most producers might have to sit there and give them a little bit more direction to justify their jobs, but my job here really has been to be the singer and to talk with, with Biff Watson about, um, you know, arrangements and stuff. We've already spoken about the arrangements before we got in. So it's been great just letting those guys have their head. Come over here to Brent Mason and you just see, I mean, obviously, he's blue telly that he's been, I've been requesting that he plays for most of the session isn't here. But the thing I love about what Brent does too is the fact that he's, he's got such great instinct with songs. Um, he'll know what's working. Uh, he'll, he'll listen to his tone. He, you'll hear him every now and then messing around with a patch lead or something like that. And I really get inspired out of, I suppose, hearing him play because once he starts playing, I know it's exactly the way I heard it. I asked him to come out here the other day and, and do a Strat solo on this particular song. He picks up the Strat, plays it exactly the way I wanted it, and I think that's, that's the, the secret to having Brent here as well. Um, he, it wouldn't have been the record without him. It was like almost who we built the band around with Biff. I said, if I can't get Brent Mason, I'll move the earth to the left one inch just to make sure he moves in. Well, I haven't felt like this for a long time. Thinking about drinking again was just an idea that I came up with uh, with Don Sampson and, and Monty Holmes and I, I thought to myself I want to write something that's going to be feeling old already and that was that was the idea the whole thing was we wanted to write something that was totally retro so we kept throwing around ideas and um, before I knew it we'd come up with this thinking about drinking title and then everything started to fall into place and it was just like really really obvious what we had to say about drinking again Thinking about that old familiar feeling And I can always count on taking comfort in And I wonder, can it still drown? What an amazing day. I'm feeling very, very drained out. And I'm gonna go and have dinner with a mate and then fall over and go to sleep. But it was everything I dreamed of, and some, just to be able to play with that band and hear those songs come to life. So, next batch tomorrow. Can't wait. Be awesome fun. Well, I get the question a lot too. Um, of what the difference will be between I Love This Place and, um, and this new record. And I mean, obviously, just recording here in Nashville is going to be a, a point of difference, but I think the, the difference is the fact that, you know, when we relocated here with the kids last year for the three months, 
it was just to make sure that I was continuing to learn. And I've explained it to a lot of friends and they totally get it. And they said, look, it's a real testament to, to you as a musician too, to say that while you're actually, you know, continuing to learn, you're not going to fall into a, into a hole anywhere because it's all new. So I wanted to give myself one of those let's learn some more stuff experiences. And um, even though 80% of this record was written in Australia, and I'm going to be saying some stuff in these songs that the American band won't get at all, and that's, that's okay too, I think it's going to be great to put a, a different band, um, they'll have a different idea on how to play these songs. And I think it'll be a, another take on how to bring Australian country music you know, together in an album. And the album's going to be called Home, and I'm really, really stuck on that title because of the song and how personal it is to me as well. So yeah, it's going to be different to I Love This Place. It's got similar sort of sentiment to some of the songs. It's family orientated. Um, it's talking about embracing the day and a few things too, and I think it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Having Brian Sutton upstairs on the first day yesterday was interesting too because between he and um, what Brent does as well, you've got a, a total you know, bluegrass player upstairs who plays amazingly fast and a uh, beautiful banjo as well. Brian Sutton played some banjo as well. But I think they pushed each other a bit too, which was great. They, they tended to work off each other. And at the end of this uh, Railway Man song that we had, I could hear them both just getting to their parts and, and doing the best they could with their solos and then thinking about it again and going back and having another go. And that means you're getting the best. This old town is full of memories From its lonely streets to the tall, tall trees Little houses built on an old floodplain We dread the summer and we fear the rain Well, my wife made the fatal mistake um, and here I am at the Guitar Centre, of course, I, I, they've got great banjos and I could easily walk out with this one but she gave me a little Epiphone banjo uh, for Christmas and we were staying at Caloundra up, at, in, uh, up the north coast of Queensland. And as soon as I got it, even you know, not being able to help myself, I sat down, got straight online, worked out how to tune the thing because it wasn't in tune. And then I started messing with it. And the first thing that came naturally, I suppose, was just a bit of a roll. And uh, I didn't realise at the time, but within the month, we we're going to be inundated with the biggest flood that we've seen since 1974 and it was a massive clean up and we, we got in there and we, we started to work on the place and each day um, just became more and more bogged down with, with the emotional stuff we're finding in our shed and through the house and um, it just made me get quite inspired. I had the banjo with me because it was in the back of the car so each night we'd go home after cleaning up and I'd sit with the banjo drinking a rum just tinkering on it and I remember the first words that came to mind were um, we just sit down and just go um, this old town is full of memories From its lonely streets to the tall, tall trees Little houses built on an old floodplain We dread the summer and we fear the rain And straight away um, I started writing this song, The River Runs And it was just one of those compelling songs I suppose that really inspired me to just make sure it was in, in the mix of the record. And it had to have banjo on it too, because it was written on the banjo. So um, I'm really hoping we get a chance to get uh, Brian Sutton, who's coming to play, to emulate the same vibe that we had on the, on the record. And it'll be really interesting to see uh, what people think of it back home in Brisbane too, because I think everyone was affected in a different way and everyone's friends and relations were affected in one way or another. And it brought everyone together. The thing I, I was inspired about most of all was um, it made families a lot stronger. And I think what it did, it brought communities together because people are leaning over their fences saying, is there anything I can do? And on our cleanup, um, we had people just coming down the track 
from the army and from the local pie shop or from the local pet rescue and just showed the community spirit is still alive and well in Queensland and I was really, really proud to uh, have been able to, to be a part of the clean up too but also to be uh, you know, treated so nicely by people you don't even know. Well I'd finally made the decision to make the record in Nashville and I was at a, a bit of a, a wit's end about who to use as the guy that's in the corner for me and as a session leader. And I sent an email off to Keith Urban, he's a good mate and always really respect his opinion on the recording side of it and he said because of uh, having a musician that everyone loves and respects on your side as a producer or as a, a session leader is always really important to get the best out of the players. And at home it's Rod McCormick, I, I love working with Rod at home. I think everyone's got that mutual respect for him and it was the same with Biff Watson. Keith just sent an email back saying, you know what, Biff Watson would be, be your man. He's a, an acoustic player, he would get what you do as a guitar player, singer-songwriter. And he said he's a good guy that everyone respects and loves and he'd be nice to have in your corner. So I sent a quick email off to Biff and, and just said, look, would you be interested in this project? He hadn't heard anything I'd done. I could have been anyone, I guess. And, but he came straight back and said, look, I'm in town that month and I'm interested. That was all he wrote back. And I thought, wow, this is great. Biff Watson played on you know, so many beautiful records and a great acoustic player. That sounds good. Yeah. How do you say Orange Blossom Special in Australian? Orange Blossom Special. Oh, cool! <laughs> <laughs> we have so much you that impression. That impression. <laughs> None of the songs will impress you, but that will. <laughs> so having Biff Watson on board for me was really crucial to getting the album together. And then he started, you know, talking about what players I wanted to use, and obviously we, we chose a lot of the, the people that are in the players. And then it led to engineering. And he said, look, I use Ed C a lot. He said, he's been in town a long time, he knows what he's doing. And as soon as I met Ed, um, I just knew I was gonna click with him. He was just a really good bloke, really conscientious. He played me some mixes that he'd done. And the last thing he'd mixed was a Hank Williams Jr. song, <laughs> or an album. And I just went, wow, this is just amazing stuff. So sitting down and talking to him, he's been probably out of, out of everyone in, involved with the project too, the most interested in all the Aussie terms that we've got in, in the actual songs. He's been saying, now, now what's a ringer? And he's going, what's a gangy? And he's asking all these questions and I love that because it, it, it makes you feel like you're imparting something from home to people here. But he took a genuine interest in, in the lyrical content of some of the songs on this record. Well, uh, I was, when I was living here last year, um, I was writing down a lot of ideas in our little rental house about things I'd like to write with different people. And I was about to go and do a write with an expat Australian here, Phil Barton, and Phil's been here for, for yonks. But my grandfather always had this old saying, he said that, you know, even if you're, if you're buried with nothing, I think the only legacy to leave behind is to be known as a good person, you know? And <clears throat> it stuck with me for years, and, and I'd always think of pop when I'd, I'd think of this phrase. And I thought, well, I'll take it to Phil. Um, I remember with my Uncle Jerry in particular, who was like my father figure too, we spent many a time fixing cars and I'd take my car, he'd sometimes have to tow my car from my house at Halfway Creek across to his. And the messing around we'd do, we'd pull a carburetor apart and he'd have it in a million bits and he'd have the little manual and he's reading about how to put it back together. And I was in admiration of someone that could actually explode something like that and then put it back together. And the feeling that I got standing back with him all greasy and had been working on the car all day and he kicks her over and it starts and I go, wow. And I still get the same feeling, I suppose, when, when, when the old guy next door to me that fixed my tractor after the floods, you know, it, it, um, its clutch was seized from the water. Um, I'd done everything else I could, I drained all the oil out and when I sing Good Man on stage, we've only done it a couple of times, but I know that when I record it, I'm gonna get on my computer while I'm doing this vocal and bring up a picture of my Uncle Jerry and just remember the feeling that we got when we, we that of achievement, you know, to get something going together. And, um, and I'll never ever forget all the stuff he taught me, but this, this song will always take me back to, to that time. Looking back on this last week and a half, you know, it's really interesting. I never did think that we could cram as much as we've crammed in here in a week and a half. It feels like I've been here for a month almost. The first uh, couple of days was 
just getting everything ready, getting you know all the lyrics printed up and getting everything ready. Going into the studio last Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, cutting uh, 16 songs where we only thought we'd probably get 14. Uh, got all that done and then I, I got crook and ended up laying up in the motel for, for two days and I had to do that. And my ears are still sort of blocked even though um, you know we got through the vocals this, this week. But that seemed like it was almost a week and a half, two weeks ago as well, but it was only this weekend just gone. Now I look at all the, the things we've, we've put down, the band track days were phenomenal. Uh, every time Biff would walk down from each take of each song, he didn't care about what it sounded like straight up, he'd just look straight at me and say, are you happy? And I'd go, it sounds amazing, moving to the next song, you know, and people would come in and listen to their parts and go out and try and better them. They, they gave they gave me a lot of attention, I think, on the day to, to make sure the songs had every, every bit that they could give it and, and I really felt proud of that and it was nice. One thing that really affected me, I suppose, looking back now on the whole project, I said to Biff when we sat down and had a coffee in between uh, the two of the first sessions, I said, it's so good that players of this calibre are giving us so much and, and really taking care and attention with these songs. And he said, well, most of them have been on YouTube probably and had a look at what you've probably done and that he said you're more like one of us than just someone that just comes in and sings you play guitar and you write and you, you, you sing you know and um, I felt really happy to hear that because I, I felt that I did get respect from the guys but it was really nice to know that they were just everyday blokes they came in and and gave it everything they had and, and due to, to Biff being involved too it was nice to have someone that cared and took everything really really seriously and gave us the best we could and what my whole goal has been is to take an album back to Australia that sounds different, that is 14 or whatever of the best songs I could possibly write in two years that I've had to write this record. And um, it's all about the quality, not the quantity. And I think that um, that's, that's what I've aimed to do and I'm, I'm hoping that it's, it's definitely on track to do that for my, my friends and fans back home in Australia. Every twist and turn.